All right, Psalm 51 could be called a prayerful hymn of repentance. Even in his failings, David was a man after God's own, own heart. He was ready and willing to cast himself upon the mercy of God. The superscription says, A Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. We all know the story here. Um, Instead of being where he should have been and doing what he should have been doing, leading his troops into battle, David was home loitering on his roof when he saw Bathsheba. And it was lust at first sight, I guess you could say. He immediately found out who she was, and then he sent for her, and he had sex with her. No concern for God's will in the matter. No concern for Bathsheba, how this would affect her life. No concern for her husband. No concern for her father. No concern for his own servants who would know what was going on. No, at this moment, David was only concerned about himself, about David. He was like a deer in the rut. He was completely consumed in his lust. This is a man after God's own heart. Be on the alert, guys. Be on the alert. Like David, every one of us is capable of being consumed in sin. And it always has a seemingly innocent start, like David, just out enjoying the view there. Well, Bathsheba turned up pregnant, you remember, and David attempted to cover it up by bringing Uriah, her husband, back from battle. But Uriah had so much honor, he refused the comforts of his own home while his fellow soldiers were still, were still on the battlefield. So David had him killed. And Nathan rebukes David in 2 Samuel 12. And let's turn there first, 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to review that and then we'll read the psalm that, that David wrote after this account. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Starting in verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and he said, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. He would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely this man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb foretold, because he did this thing and had no compassion." And Nathan said to David, you are the man, you're the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house. and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I do this thing before all Israel under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. 
Notice how David did not see the magnitude of his own sin. He convicted the man in Nathan's story to death for stealing a sheep. Yet he stole a man's wife and then murdered that man. Why is that? Why does our mind have this ability to minimize our own sin and try to justify it? Well, I don't know, but it does. You know, we are just as deserving of death as the other guy. Or like David, probably even more deserving than the other guy. May the Lord show us the depths of our sin. Another thing to notice is David allowed Nathan to speak to him. And he listened to him. It's important. Do you have a Nathan? Do you have a person that you allow to speak freely to you? If you don't, I want you to, I want to ask you to get one. This week, don't wait. In fact, start praying right now that the Lord would give a name of a person that could be your Nathan. God has someone in mind for you, for each one of us. And then go talk to that person. Be honest with them. Tell them your sins, the sins you struggle with. And have them pray for you. And have them ask you from time to time how you're doing. You know, kind of like an accountability partner. Follow the Lord's leading. You don't want to pick someone that you'll cause to stumble or someone that'll be, that won't be discreet with what you tell them. And of course, if you're, ma- if you're a man, you need a brother in Christ. And if you're a woman, you, it needs to be a sister in Christ. Someone you look up to, someone that you will accept the wisdom that they will give you. Will you do that this week? The Lord may have given you a name already. I'm going to do that myself this week. All right? I'm going to challenge you guys to do that. So after David was confronted by Nathan and confessed his sin, he wrote Psalm 51. So let's look at Psalm 51 now. It's for the choir director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet had come to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you, You only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, that I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So we see David pleading for forgiveness. David asked to be washed of the filthiness of his sin. He says that he has sinned against God alone. And David's not saying that he hasn't wronged Bathsheba or her husband or all those involved. David was just getting to the heart of the matter. Remember, sin is disobedience, disobeying God, doing what I want instead of what God wants. We sin against, uh, against God, and others suffer the ramifications of that sin, of that disobedience. When we disobey God, people get hurt. Whether we see it or not, people are affected. So David pleads for forgiveness. And do you remember what Nathan told him? We had just read it in, in 2 Samuel twelve thirteen. It says, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because of this deed, you, are given occasion, you have given occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also is born, that is born to you shall surely die. So God took away David's sin. David's disobedience was removed. It was forgiven. However, he still had to suffer the consequences of that sin, the ramifications of that sin. 
So after being forgiven, David wants to be restored. He wants a fresh start with God. And he says this in verse 10. Let's continue on. He says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. David longs to be restored and to be sustained in that restoration. God, don't, God won't take his Holy Spirit from us. But we can resist the Spirit. We can quench the Spirit. We can even grieve the Spirit. Like David, we can feel when we're not right with the Spirit. David was miserable during this time before he confessed. The guilt of his sin was not going away. He was so ready for Nathan to come to him. And now he asked the Lord to restore that fellowship with the Spirit and bring the joy that joy that's beyond understanding, the joy that is big enough to experience even in the midst of tears. David says, bring that back to me, Lord. You know, there's no joy in the world. The world will stumble across happiness from time to time, but there's no real joy. The only real joy is in the Lord. And David says, sustain me with a willing spirit. We have to be willing. David knows that God won't force him. And so he asks God to keep his spirit willing. What a great thing to pray for. Now David continues. He says what the outcome will be. The byproduct of of what will be when God restores him and sustains him. We see this in verse 13. He says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. So David is anticipating what the fruitfulness of God's restoration will be. David first applies this to his own life, and then he applies it to the whole city of Jerusalem. You know, as we stumble in sin, others are affected. They suffer the ramifications of that sin. However, as we repent, others are affected by this as well. They experience the positive byproducts of God's restoration. And right now, what a great time to repent. The start of a new year. What a great time. Let me encourage you, guys. This week, this morning, confess your sin and then stop doing it. That's what repent means, to turn from it. Confess it, stop it. And then put a Nathan in your life, someone that will help you be accountable. Someone that will ask you those difficult questions. Don't wait. Start this morning with that. All right, Psalm 52. Psalm 52 is for the choir director. It's a mass skill of David. When Doeg, the Edomite, came and told Saul and said to him, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. This is an interesting story. David and Jonathan, Saul's sons, had just made a covenant. Jonathan was going to find out if Saul really wanted to kill David. And Saul did. He did want to kill him. So Jonathan told David to get out of town. And while he was running for his life, David went to Nob, where the tabernacle was, where all the priests were. And let's turn to 1 Samuel this time, and we'll read what happened here before David wrote this psalm. 1 Samuel Samuel 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21, in verse 1. 
Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? This was weird. This would be like the uh, vice president showing up by himself. No secret service, no entourage, no anybody. It just was really strange. And Ahimelech was wondering what was going on. He was trembling. And uh, David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter and has, has said to me, Let no one know anything about this matter on which I am sending you and which I have commissioned you. When really David's just running from his life. And uh, he said, I have, directed young, I have directed the young men to a certain place. So David tells them, oh, I, I hid my, my entourage. They're, they're hiding over here. They're in this certain place. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest answered David and said, there is no ordinary bread on hand, but there's the consecrated bread. But only if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us as, a previ- as previously when I would set out on the vessels of the young men were holy. Though it was an ordinary journey, how much more than today will their vessels be holy? Because they're on this top double secret you know, uh, mission that David is imagining. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. For there was no bread, but the bread of the presence, which was removed before the Lord in order to put the hot bread in its place when it was taken away. Now, one of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. David said to Ahimelech, now is not, is there not a spear or sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's matter was so urgent. The priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. So David lied to Ahimelech. He didn't tell him he was fleeing from the king. He said he was commissioned by the king, commissioned by Saul. I would imagine David was trying to protect Ahimelech, maybe, so that he would not be willingly helping a fugitive. Or maybe he thought Ahimelech would help, wouldn't help him if he knew the truth. Either way, David lied to him. And by lying to him, he took Ahimelech's freedom to make the choice for himself away. Whether he wanted to aid the fugitive or not, he couldn't make that choice because David lied to him. Well, let's continue in... in Second, in First Samuel there, just skip up to 22 and look at verse 6, and we're going to see what happens. First Samuel 22, 6. Then Saul heard that David and his men who were with him had been discovered. Now Saul was sitting at Gibeah under a tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand, And all his servants were standing around him. Saul said to his servants who stood around him, Hear now, O Benjamites, will the son of Jesse also give to you all of the fields and vineyards? Will he make make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? For, For all of you have conspired against me so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son, Jonathan, makes a covenant with the son of Jesse, with David. And there is none of you who is... Sorry for me, or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie ambush, as it is this day. Then Doeg the Edomite, who was standing by the servants of Saul, said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob. And Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Then the king sent someone to summon Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitab, and his father's household, and the priest who were in Nob. All of them came to the king, and Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitab. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. Saul said to him, Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, so that he would rise up against me lying in ambush as it is this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among your servants is as faithful as David, even the king's son-in-law, 
Who is captain over your guard and honored in your house? Did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything on his servant or into any of the household of my father, for your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. So Ahimelech didn't know anything about this. But the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. And the king said to the guards who were attending him, Turn around and put the, all the priests of the Lord to death, because their hand is also with David, and because they know they knew he was fleeing and did not reveal it to me. But the servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hand to attack the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, you turn around and attack the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned around and attacked the priest. And he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. And he struck Nob in the city of the priest with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants, also oxen and donkeys and sheep. He struck with the edge of the sword. David should have told Ahimelech the truth so he could have chosen either or not to help David and to not help David and report him to the king or at least help him and he would have died for a cause he believed in. Notice how the guards refused to follow Saul's orders because they knew Ahimelech was innocent but not doing. He massacred the whole city. Well, David writes in Psalm 52, in response to this. Let's go to 52, verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. Selah. You love all the words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous will see and fear and will laugh at him saying, Behold, the man who, is not, who has not made God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. You know, it kind of sounds as if David blames Doeg for telling the truth to Saul. You know, but I don't think that's where Doeg went wrong. The king had asked a question, and Doeg answered truthfully. But where he went wrong is when he followed the order to kill innocent people. He, he especially should have refused, like the rest of the soldiers, because he was there, and he knew Ahimelech was innocent. But either way, he was not seeking refuge in the Lord, was he? He was trusting that Saul would reward him. Now, David contrasts himself to Doeg in verse 8. He says, but as for me, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. I will give you thanks forever because you have done it. And I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. So David placed his confidence in the name of God, and he relied upon God. You know, we should do the same when we're surrounded by troubles, when we're under attack. We need to claim God as our stronghold, as our fortress, as our refuge. Not like Doeg, who's relying on Saul. We don't want to do that. Psalm 53 Psalm 53 is a hymn about the corruption and destruction of godless men. And this is a virtual repeat of Psalm 14. It was written later in David's life, sort of a rewrite to fit a different occasion. It has a different superscription. Psalm 53 is for the choir director. And this psalm uses the title God instead of the name Lord in all caps. That's one of the differences. And the other one is verse 5 is totally different from Psalm 14. But the rest of it is pretty much the same. It, the superscription says, For the choir director, according to the Mahalath, a mis masculine of David. Well, verses 1 through 3 reveal the foolishness of the human race. Verse 1, 
The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have committed abominable injustice. There is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands, who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. You know, Paul quotes this in Romans chapter 3 when he's speaking of man's sinful nature in order to prove man's need for redemption. You know, this dispels the common belief that if you're more good than bad, you go to heaven. I don't know where that idea came from. Actually, I guess it probably came from Satan, but God's word never never alludes to some sort of scales that weigh your good against the bad. There's nothing like that in Scripture. God told Adam, if you disobey me, you will die. That was pretty much it. If you eat that, you're going to die. This psalm tells us that we have all disobeyed and we have all earned death, just like Adam. Verse 4. Have the workers of wickedness no knowledge who eat up my people as though they ate bread and have not called upon God? There they were in great fear, where no fear had been. For God scattered the bones of him who encamped against you. You put them to shame because God had rejected them. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores his captive people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. There is no fear of God before the eyes of this world. Well, man will see it one day, won't he? You know, man likes to act so fearless, so tough. But one day, every person will experience the fear of God, the respect that God deserves. We're told every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. It's just a matter of time. Psalm 54. Psalm 54 is a prayer for defense against enemies. And this psalm, it says, was made for the stringed instruments. So it's kind of interesting that God was specific about the type of instrument that should be used to play along. It's a mass skill. It's a song of, which means a song of contemplation or reflection. You know, songs can can edify us, build us up, as well as instruct us. It's it's pretty neat. Uh, And it continues, this psalm was written when the Zephites came and said to Saul, is not David hiding himself among us? And again, turn back to 1 Samuel 23. We're going to look at what happened here, what caused David to write this psalm. 1 Samuel 23. And we're going to start in verse 15. 1 Samuel 23, 15. Now David came aware that Saul had come out to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went out to David at Horish and encouraged him in God. He encouraged him in God. Thus he said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul my father will not find you, and you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul my father knows that also. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed at Horish while Jonathan went to his house. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in the strongholds at Horish on the hill of Heshelah, which is is on the south of Jezimon? Now then, O king, come down according to all thy desire of your soul to do so, and And our part shall be to surrender him to the king's hand. Saul said, May you be blessed of the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. So David gets ratted out again. Last time it was Doeg, this time by the Ziphites. But first, I want you to notice Jonathan, the son of Saul, who is next in line for the throne of Israel, right? He's the son of the king. He would be the next king. He went out to David out of his way, and encouraged him in, the, in God, in the Lord. It's very, very important. We talked earlier about us getting a Nathan, someone to hold us accountable. 
Now I want you guys to be a Jonathan. I want you to go to someone and encourage them in God. This week, okay, two things. I want you to get a Nathan. I want you to be a Jonathan. You don't want to be a Doeg or a Ziphite. And notice how the Ziphites were not directly asked by Saul about David. They sought out Saul to tell, to tell David's whereabouts. I don't know why. I don't know if they had something against David. But Anyway, that leads us to the, to the writing, to David's writing of Psalm 54. 54 1 says, Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your power. Hear my power, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me, and violent men have sought my life. They have not set their they have not set God before them. Selah. So the first half of this psalm, David records this urgent prayer for deliverance. He based his petition on the name of God. God's name represents who he is and what he has done. The name above all names, right? The reason for David's appeal was that violent men with no regard for God were trying to destroy him. Well, he continues in verse 4. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. He will recompense the evil to my foes, destroying them in your faithfulness. Destroy them in your faithfulness. Willingly, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from all trouble. And my eye has looked with satisfaction upon my enemies. So the second half of this psalm is David's confident assertion of his trust in God. He says, God is my helper and the sustainer of my soul. Well, God is our helper too. He will help us and sustain us if we allow him, if we look to him, if we rely upon him. You know, David is confident that God has heard him and that God will deliver him. Could you imagine being in in his shoes, being an, an innocent fugitive from a corrupt government and you're hiding out in the woods in the middle of nowhere? And the only people you run into out in the middle of nowhere go out of their way to rat you out, to turn you in. That could be so hopeless, so discouraging, couldn't it? So overwhelming. But not for David. He confidently trusted in the Lord. Well, do you think Jonathan had anything to do with that? When he came to David and encouraged him in the Lord? I do. Have you ever been encouraged in the Lord? What a blessing. What a blessing that is. So again, guys, this week, I want to encourage all of you to do two things, two huge things. These are big things I'm asking of you. First, I want you to get a Nathan. I want you to get somebody that will hold you accountable. And the second thing is I want you to find a John, to be a Jonathan. To encourage someone in the Lord, anybody, it could be someone at work, someone you know, a friend, just to encourage them in the Lord. It's powerful, it's powerful to be encouraged in the Lord. You don't have to do it in that order. You can encourage someone and get someone in your life to be accountable to. I'm going to do that myself this week, all right? And I encourage all of you to do that. If you need prayer this morning, come forward. I'll be down here. The other elders will be down here. We would love to pray with you. This beginning of the new year, what a great day for a fresh start, a fresh start, a fresh uh, relationship with the Lord. We'll be down here. Would you, would you pray with me now? Father, we just want to thank you for your word. Thank you for these examples, Lord. Thank you for using people, for using Nathan in David's life, Lord. He longed so much to come back to you. And he couldn't do it without without that Nathan, without Nathan coming to him. Lord, I ask that you would help us, help each one of us. Lord, give us a name right now of a person that will be a Nathan for us, that will help us be accountable to you, Lord. 
And Lord, your encouraging words are so awesome, Lord. And the way you used Jonathan was so powerful. I ask that you would do that, that you would use each one of us the same, Lord, that we would be open uh, to be an encouragement to others, Lord, that we would be open to that, that you would guide us, that you would show us who needed encouragement, and that you would give us the courage to be that in, be encouraging, just to say a few words, Lord, just to encourage them in you and let them know that you love them. Thank you for that. Watch over us this week. Help us, Lord. Help us this week to rely on you for strength, for your power, for your guidance as we live our lives for you. In Jesus' name we pray.